Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So a question that I get asked often is, does this thing in my room cause a problem? Yeah, so there's maybe a, a cubby, there's a, a support beam, like a, a pillar in the wall or in the a beam in the ceiling. Maybe the a typical one is the 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 monitor, my computer monitor, my computer screen, uh, some sort of furniture. Is this causing a problem in my room? Is this somehow reflecting sound or is changing the sound in some way that it's messing up what I'm hearing? And uh, it's a fair enough question, right? So the, the, the thing is, it's also a little difficult to answer because it's very, very situation dependent. But what I want to do in this video is give you a way of analyzing, of um, estimating how big an, a, an object's impact is on the sound using a very, very simple formulation, a very simple rule of thumb that you can follow to figure this out. All right, let's get into it. So one quick distinction I have to make actually before I talk about this, analyzing this object, whatever it might be, is obviously another another common problem that might appear, another thing that might be causing a problem is something vibrating. And let me just get that out of the way. So if something, if you're worried that something might be vibrating, something might be causing unwanted sound in the room as you're playing music, a simple way to figure that out is to just play a sine sweep, right? So you just generate a sine wave with some sort of synthesizer. Uh, DAWs often have plugins that can generate sine waves at different frequencies. And you just generate the sine wave, you play it through your speakers, and then you sweep through the audible spectrum and you do it slowly maybe or quicker at first to kind of figure out where something might be resonating and then you kind of narrow down as you hear as things start rattling in the room and then you kind of yeah you just kind of narrow it down and then you figure out what that thing is and then it's all about just putting some sort of uh, stopping it from rattling obviously by maybe covering it with something so a very cheap option if you want to buy something if like a, your desk is rattling or there are some pipes or some some panels in the ceiling in the wall there's something rattling is to get these vibration damping mass loaded vinyl packs i guess uh, these little little squares that you can buy off of amazon they're meant for cars usually for people who kind of tune their sound system in cars they're self-adhesive mass loaded vinyl pieces of material that you can just stick on stuff and they're really really cheap and that's a, a really easy option if you just want to stop something from rattling to uh to get that to work yeah so uh so let, let's just get that out of the way first if you've got some sort of vibration resonance rattling problem do a sign sweep figure out what it is and then tighten that screw put something against it, get one of those damping, that vibration damping panels and stick it on there and be done with it. All right, moving on to the more interesting part. So you've got something in your room and you're wondering whether it's causing a problem. Yeah, the, the, the thing to understand and the way to estimate how large the impact is and most importantly, at what frequency range the problem, a problem might appear is to understand wavelengths and how wavelengths interact with objects. And the simple rule of thumb to follow here is that a sound wave will interact, will see an object if it is roughly the size of its wavelength or bigger, right? So rather the object is bigger, right? So if a sound wave is this long, <laughs> Yeah, it will see an object that is roughly that size or bigger. Or in other words, a sound wave that is this long and any sound wave uh, wavelength that is shorter than that, so, so higher frequency, will also see that object. That's the kind of the, the basic thing to get in your head is when you're thinking about what sound waves or how sound waves interact with objects. 
okay? So a quick way to estimate this in terms of frequency is to be aware of some kind of uh, or the, the main markers of wavelength that you can then extrapolate from, okay? And this is based on the simple equation that relates wavelength and frequency. And that is that frequency equals the speed of sound times the wavelength. It's a very, very simple formulation. And if we plug some simple numbers in here, let the speed of sound at 20 degrees centigrade, sort of average room temperature and sea level is 344 meters per second, very generally speaking. So if we've got a wavelength of one meter and we plug it in, it's 344 times one. That means a wavelength of one meter equals a frequency of 344 hertz, just as an example. Yeah, but there are easier markers to use to extrapolate from, okay? So one that I tend to use is just like 100 hertz, one kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, okay? 100 hertz, if we plug that into the, into the equation, is a wavelength of 3.44 meters, roughly three and a half meters, okay? One kilohertz, is just that divided by 10. So it's not 3.44 meters, it's 34 centimeters. And 10 kilohertz is that divided by 10 again. So 3.4 centimeters. By the way, for all you people still working in Imperial, get with the times. Sorry about that, but seriously, let's just keep it metric, keep it simple. Um, Imperial is based on metric anyway, as far as I know. So again, get with the times. Um, but so we can use those markers to kind of extrapolate what, where an object, at what frequency an object might, might start causing problems, okay? So the, the, the way to do this is to start with one of these numbers and then just halve or double that number. And you're always halving or doubling the frequency as you go along. So starting with 100 hertz, 3.44 meters wavelength. If you double that, you get 200 hertz and that is half the wavelength. So roughly 1.6, 1.7 meters wavelength, 200 Hertz. We double it again, 400 Hertz. That means we half the wavelength. So now we're looking at 85 centimeters roundabout wavelength, okay? So you can see how you can use this, these, these markers to quickly get an, an idea of what uh, size of objects, what wavelengths, and what frequencies they, what frequencies those actually equate to, and meaning what, and how we can deduce at what frequencies they start causing issues. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of examples. One question that I, one question that I get often is with the the panels that you see in the back of my room when people follow my build a better base trap course and they build these panels, they put them up in the room, they plan the layout. And the question is, doesn't, uh, won't the edges of these absorber frames cause unwanted reflections? Well, so the panel is roughly a meter high. Yeah, that means the, the kind of the biggest length on the side of one of those panels is just over a meter. Yeah, so one thing we can do is we can just plug that in the equation. Yeah, so wave, we just say what wavelength or that we, 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 we take that as a wavelength. So roughly one meter, plug it into the equation. So 344 times one. So we can estimate that only sound waves of around 344, let's say 355 Hertz and up will actually see this frame, the, this piece of wood as, that makes the frame of this absorber. Lower frequencies just bend around it and don't actually see this, this surface, okay? So just to give you an idea, yeah, we can also think about it in terms of this, uh, this rule of thumb that I mentioned before, starting at 100 hertz, that's three and a half meter wavelength. Yeah, we're talking, we want to get down to one meter, remember? That's, so that's the kind of the diagonal of the board on the side of this absorber frame. So 100 hertz, is three and a half meters. So 200 Hertz is 1.7 meters. So 400 Hertz is around about 85, 90 centimeters. 
Yeah. Now we're, we've gone a bit too far, so we can already deduce it's going to be somewhere between 200 and 400 hertz, the starting frequency uh, at which sound waves see this object. Okay. Another example. Yeah. Let's say we're placing these panels in a recording room and we're spreading them out more evenly. We've got some spaces in between panels or on the ceiling, maybe there's a light fixture that we're, we're, we, we don't want to cover up. So we're, we're placing our panels around this light fixture, let's say, and it creates a gap of going in here now, roughly two feet yeah, around this light fixture. So that's about 60 centimeters. Okay, so once again, we start at 100 hertz, three and a half meters. 200 hertz, 1.7 meters, 400 hertz, 80 to 90 centimeters. So 800 hertz is going to be around 40, 45 centimeters. So that's too short already. But that tells us that only sound waves with a wavelength or with a frequency rather of somewhere between 400 and 800 hertz will actually start seeing this gap. Any sound waves below that don't actually see and interact with this gap between the panels. Okay, so that's how you kind of go about estimating at what frequency an object is seen by the sound wave and starts interacting potentially with the sound wave. But there is obviously one other part to this, and that is the question of whether sound is actually directed towards this object and whether this object with how it's positioned in the room reflects energy back to a point of interest, usually the listening position where you're sitting and mixing your music. Okay. So, so you have to take that into account as well. If the, if the, the object, if the surface, for example, is angled in a way that it doesn't reflect sound back to your listening position, well, then the problem isn't going to be as large if it's kind of directly sitting there and you're doing a very kind of simple inbound angle versus outbound angle uh, analysis and thinking, okay, seeing that, okay, a sound that impacts this, this, this surface must also reflect back to my listening position. Yeah? If it does that, then we look at the size of the surface and we can estimate at what frequency it actually starts being seen and thus might cause a reflection. Okay, but if the surface is angled in a way so that it doesn't really reflect sound back to your listening position, well, who cares, right? That's kind of the case with these panels in the back of my room. If you see these, 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 it's actually on the side, isn't it? If you see these corners here, yeah, or this on the other side, even that, that corner, uh, that corner right there, that's not going to reflect sound back to this position right here. So it can't really cause much of a problem, yeah? no matter how big that surface how big that surface is okay so so those are kind of the 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 main things to keep in mind when you're trying to to estimate how big uh, how much of a problem a surface an object and in your room can cause how big is it in terms of diagonal in terms of kind of biggest dimension what frequency does that relate to yeah, by, by either following these estimates that I talked about before or just using plugging numbers into the formula. And then also looking at the angles involved and whether it reflects sound back to the listening position. One final note about this, don't forget to see it in the larger context of what you're doing, okay? Acoustics, just like mixing a record, treating a room and fixing, improving the acoustics, is lots of little steps in the right direction. Yeah, it's just like when you're mixing a record, it's lots and lots of little moves. In the same way, when you're improving the sound in your room, you're fixing or you're improving, you're removing lots of little effects that all pile up on top of each other to create the actual acoustic imprint of the room, this, the sound field of the room, if you will. Yeah, and you always have to ask yourself, if, if this one thing is causing an issue, well, how big is its impact as part of the bigger picture of solving all the issues that your room is causing, that your room creates at your listening position? Yeah? So always see it in context as well. One little step, just like when you're mixing and you kind of miss one little step or you don't do it perfectly, one little step isn't going to make or break the end result. 
And that's usually the same with problems created by certain very particular objects in your room. Yeah, sure, they might create a particular effect on the acoustic signature on the sound at your listening position. But as part of the, the, the large context of all the stuff that's happening in your room, how big is that impact really? Probably marginal. Yeah, that doesn't mean you should ignore it because fixing the room, improving the sound is doing all those little steps correctly. And the more of those st steps you can take correctly, the better the end result will be. But that just that's just a way to think about or that's a way to think about this 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 problem, a problem to understand both how large its impact is seen individually and as part of the bigger context. OK, and if you are, by the way, if you are, if you're kind of in the process of treating your room and you want some bigger picture guidance on what all those little steps are, I've broken them down into five main steps in my home studio treatment framework that you can download at the link in the description. It's the five steps that I take in order to treat a home studio. It's the same steps that I teach my students. It's the same steps that I go through with people who I help with the process of treating their rooms. And it's it's all those things that you read on the internet that you should be doing, but put in a larger context in a sequence that you can follow where each step builds on the one before so that you don't start turning in circles because you missed something at some point and then you figure out, oh, I should have done this thing before. And then you need to go back and rip stuff apart and change everything and waste a load of time and get really confused in the process. Yeah. So this is the simple framework that I follow that I think you should follow if you're treating your room. And so if you are currently in the process, if you're thinking about treating your room, then I want you to download my home studio treatment framework and get clear on what those steps are that you need to take, where in this process you are, what the next step is that you need to be focusing on. Okay, great. Let's wrap up there. I hope that gives you a way to better assess whether something in your room is causing a problem and also just how to see it in the larger context. So let's keep learning to trust our ears and have fun working in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.